Nguyen Diem was uh, selected by uh, the Eisenhower administration to be the leader of South Vietnam for a couple of different reasons. Um, first of all, he was staunchly anti-communist. Uh, you could not be uh, an American uh, puppet ruler or an American proxy or an American viceroy in the so-called third world unless your anti-communist credentials were absolutely impeccable, and his were. In fact, uh, Ho Chi Minh, the leader of the uh, North Vietnamese of the Viet Minh co uh, communists had offered Diem a position in, uh, in his government in 1945. Diem had called Ho a criminal and a murderer to his face and stalked out of Viet Minh headquarters. So there was no question about him being staunchly anti-communist. Th those credentials were solid. Also, he was staunchly anti-colonialist. Uh, he had resisted French colonial domination of his homeland. He had resigned from the French colonial service when they wouldn't implement his uh, suggested reforms. Uh, so he, he, was, he qualified as both an anti-communist and an, uh, an anti-colonialist. And the United States could be confident that in backing Ziem, Washington wasn't going to be tarred with the brush of colonialism. Surely, if we support someone like Nguyen Ziem, no one is going to accuse us of trying to replace the French uh, with an American colony in South Vietnam. So he basically he measured up on those two scores. Also, there's the fact that he was a Catholic. And that meant an awful lot in the United States in the 1950s. There was a, a major religious revival that was sweeping the United States, Catholic credentials looked just impeccable in waging Cold War. You may have noticed that uh, the most famous communist hunter of that era, Joseph McCarthy, was himself a Catholic, won widespread Catholic support. Uh, the FBI, which was the uh, really the domestic arm of the anti-communist crusade, recruited very heavily at Catholic colleges like Fordham and Notre Dame. Uh, people like Cardinal Spellman, uh, John F. Kennedy, Mike Mansfield, all very prominent uh, Catholic uh, uh, Cold Warriors. So Ziem's Catholicism, even though he was in a country that's 90% Buddhist, um, did a great deal to sell him to the American people and make him appear, appear to be um, the ideal candidate to lead South Vietnam. In addition, uh, I don't think this reason is as important as some other scholars have claimed, but Ziem actively campaigned in the United States, while other potential South Vietnamese leaders like uh, Phan Huy Quat uh, did not campaign in the United States. They basically restricted their campaigning to Vietnam or with the absentee uh, Vietnamese Emperor Bao Dai in France, Ziem actually came to America and became well known. He stayed here for three years in the early 50s, made a number of contacts, notably uh, Cardinal Spellman, Mike Mansfield, uh, Joseph Kennedy, uh, John F. Kennedy. Um, and uh, so consequently, he, he, made him, he got his name into the mix. Um, he was the only Vietnamese candidate for leadership of South Vietnam who uh, had actively courted the superpower that ultimately would prove to matter the most. The United States supported Diem as uh, head of South Vietnam for nine years, which is an awfully long time. It was much longer than any of uh, uh, South Vietnam's subsequent leaders. Um, and Diem was able to draw upon the United States for this kind of sustained long-term support for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, within the first couple months, or at least the first year or so of Ziem's reign, he basically succeeded in either killing, jailing, or terrifying into submission any potential opponents of his rule, uh, except for the communists. You had a communist insurgency that was simmering in South Vietnam for a long time. But really, just about any other moderate, liberal, anti-communist alternative to Ziem had either been driven out of the country, had been killed, had been thrown in jail. Uh, so there didn't appear to be any viable alternative to him. You, you read this over and over again if you go to the archives and look at uh, National Security Council meetings, cabinet meetings, private memoranda, interagency reports, people just basically shrugging their shoulders and saying, we know his faults, we know he's a dictator, uh, we know he has difficulty delegating authority, we know he doesn't trust anybody outside of his own family, we know there are some reports that he might actually be insane, but he's the only candidate there. There just is no other game in town. And... Uh, um, Diem very effectively created a situation where there simply wasn't a, a, a rival that the United States could conceivably support. Although there, I argue in my first book, there were a couple of rivals in 1954-55. They were rather rapidly eliminated by Diem, and he essentially had the field to himself until, through his own uh, um, incompetence and brutality, uh, he uh, engineered this, uh, or he, he inspired, he incited this Buddhist uh, uprising in 1963 that was... Uh, um, so brutal and ghastly that it ultimately uh, compelled the Kennedy administration to collude in his overthrow. An important question uh, is who precisely were these Americans who supported Ngo Dinh Diem, uh, and why did they support him so uh, fervently and for such a long time? I want to be careful here because I've been accused uh, with my previous book of, of Catholic bashing because I, I pointed out correctly that most of Diem's really ardent supporters were Catholics. There is 
a huge difference, though, between uh, a Cold War Catholic like Francis Cardinal Spellman of New York, uh, who was uh, um, extremely conservative, uh, extremely parochial, uh, very rigid and unbending in terms of his uh, uh, approach to the world, and someone like Mike Mansfield of Montana, Senator Mike Mansfield, who had been a professor of Asian history before he joined the Senate, who was one of the most broad-minded, liberal, uh, widely traveled men in America, also a devoted, uh, a de devoted uh, a ZM supporter. Um, Joe McCarthy is on one end of the spectrum, but John F. Kennedy is on the other. Uh, they're all Catholics, but I'm not comfortable lumping them all together. Yet, it is a fact that ZM's staunchest supporters tended to be Catholics. Not all of them were. Oh, uh, John Foster Dulles, the deeply religious but Presbyterian U.S. Secretary of State, uh, uh, supported ZM. Dwight Eisenhower, who's a Protestant, supported ZM. Um, and there were many ZM supporters who weren't overtly uh, uh, religious one way or the other, in, in any particular religion, just members of the American Friends of Vietnam, which was an organization set up to burnish ZM's image in the United States, raise money for his uh, government and propagandize uh, on behalf of South Vietnam in America. If you look at the membership ranks of the American Friends of Vietnam, you see people like Norman Thomas, who was the head of the American Socialist Party, not a religious man at all. You see liberal academics like uh, Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., you see um, uh, film producers and directors like Joseph Mankiewicz, and you see Tom Dooley, the famed jungle doctor of Asia, who was an ardent Catholic, but who certainly wouldn't fit into the Spellman uh, mode of, of, uh, of Catholicism. So there's a very um, ecumenical, kind of crazy quilt quality to ZM supporters. He managed to appeal to a number of different Americans for different reasons. Uh, I think that uh, uh, this mix of anti-communism, anti-colonialism, uh, staunch religiosity, uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, the appearance of a modernizing uh, uh, so-called third world leader. Uh, it was almost the perfect mix to attract a broad base of American support. The only problem is, it wasn't the perfect mix to, mix to attract a broad base of support in South Vietnam, which was ostensibly the country that he was governing. But it did appeal in the United States. The administration of John F. Kennedy uh, ultimately decided to have ZM deposed um, in late uh, 1963 basically because of the so-called Buddhist crisis. And uh, this is a, a crisis that's been studied to death. There are a number of first-rate accounts. Uh, I think recently Howard Jones came up with a book called Death of a Generation that does a marvelous study of the, um, of the Buddhist crisis. Very simply, what happened was this. A couple of months before ZM's overthrow, um, Buddhists celebrating the Buddha's birthday in Hue uh, were ordered to take their flags down, the religious flags. Uh, there was a government decree saying that only national flags could be flown in Vietnam, in South Vietnam. Uh, the protesting Buddhists uh, said, uh, that, wait a minute, Ziem's uh, brother, Ngo Dinh Thuc, the Archbishop of Vietnam, had recently been, uh, um, uh, th 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 there had been a celebration honoring him recently in Hue, and papal banners had flown. Nobody had ordered those taken down. Why were they putting the edict into effect right now? It appeared to be more evidence of the administration's uh, pro-Catholic, anti-Buddhist bias. And uh, um, Ziem could have diffused this crisis simply by apologizing or by dealing with, less, with it less bullheadedly than he did. Basically, he refused to do anything. There was another protest in Hue a little bit later on. Uh, it resulted in a massacre. Uh, government troops fired into a crowd. Uh, armored personnel carriers ran over a few people, including some, ch some children who were crushed beneath the tanks and uh, uh, beneath the treads of these, these personnel carriers. And Ziem's regime suddenly had a full-blown public relations crisis on its hands. The Kennedy administration tried to get him to defuse the crisis by admitting that government troops had erred by making some sort of, paying some sort of reparations to the families of this uh, uh, massacre in Hue. He wouldn't do it. Uh, there were more protests, uh, um, more arrests, more people killed. And then finally, in an incident that has been immortalized in one of the most disturbing photos you'll ever see, uh, it was also filmed, uh, a, a monk by the name of Thich Quang Duc uh, burned himself alive. Basically, what happened was uh, he, he uh, drove to a very uh, major intersection in Saigon uh, with a crowd of people. He got out of this car. Uh, he, uh, his followers put a small cushion in the middle of the street for him to sit on. Uh, he sat down on the cushion. He started uh, uh, fingering the, the oak beads, basically the Namo Amita Buddha, Return to Eternal Buddha, uh, reciting this over and over again. Uh, one of his comrades brought over a, a, a big container of gasoline, poured it on Thich Quang Duc's head, uh, and Thich Quang Duc uh, lit a match, and he, his body burst into flames immediately. Um, 
and uh, uh, the monks and nuns, Buddhist monks and nuns, threw themselves uh, on the ground in front of any fire engines or fire trucks that tried to come and put him out. They kept the police from getting close to him uh, for the 10 minutes that it took for him to die. Uh, he basically just, he didn't move. Uh, with a, a breeze blew the flames from his face briefly, and then apparently uh, you could see his, his features contorted in agony, but he didn't cry out, he didn't move. He just sat there and burned for 10 minutes as his skin turned black and shriveled and fell off his body, and finally he toppled over dead. Um, this was caught by Malcolm Brown, an American photographer. Uh, after uh, he burned to death, uh, his remains were put into a, a coffin, carried to the uh, Zaloy Pagoda in Saigon. His heart was removed and placed in a chalice, and uh, people held up banners outside the, the pagoda. Um, this Buddhist priest became a martyr because of the government's uh, uh, lack of concern or word to that effect. And it was just the most horrifying image you could possibly imagine. Um, and it leapt off the front page of every newspaper in America, really in, in the Western world, the next morning. Apparently, uh, according to Robert, Robert Kennedy, he was talking to his brother, President John F. Kennedy, about the ongoing civil rights problem in Alabama. And John F. Kennedy was, was still in bed looking at the morning newspapers. And uh, Robert Kennedy was talking about Alabama. And all of a sudden, there was a pause. And John F. Kennedy apparently said, uh, Jesus Christ, when he saw this photograph on the cover. Um, and I think, really, you can date the end of the Ziem experiment, the Ziem regime, from that moment. He hung on to power for a few more months. But from that moment on, he, he was basically doomed. All the special pleading in the world was not going to take away the sting of that particular image. And Kennedy himself told the new ambassador to South Vietnam, Henry Cabot Lodge, that no image in the entire history of publishing has ever had the emotional impact that that one had. And the fact is it wasn't an isolated incident. A number of Buddhist monks and nuns followed Thich Quang Duc's uh, example, uh, burned themselves alive, usually when there was an American photographer present. And uh, finally, uh, uh, in November, early November of 1963, a cabal of generals rose up, overthrew Ziem, um, apparently, Kennedy did not consider the possibility of a violent outcome to the coup, but uh, Ziem and his brother Nhu were uh, shot and stabbed repeatedly with knives and bayonets, and their bodies were buried in a cemetery in the ex uh, outskirts of Saigon. At least that's what people say. Uh, we don't know for sure where their bodies remain. It's an unmarked grave. But that's basically what brought the Ziem experiment, or the Ziem, uh, the Ziem US uh, alliance to an end. A number of historians have argued that it was a mistake for the Kennedy administration to engineer Ziem's overthrow and assassination in November of 1963, that with all his faults, it would have been better if we had stuck with him. Because after all, look at what happened after he died. Um, communist insurgency in the South uh, increased. We had to send in all of these troops. The number of advisors and then official troops skyrocketed. And ultimately, the United States was involved in a full-blown war, as opposed to the advice and support period that occurred earlier. Therefore, some historians have argued, uh, Ziem, even though he was autocratic, and even though he wasn't very good at delegating authority, and even though he was frequently obstreperous when dealing with the United States, was the best we could have done. He served in law office much longer than any of his successors. Uh, there were a revolving door series of administrations. Uh, following his overthrow until you had some stability under Nguyen Van Thieu. But even Nguyen Van Thieu didn't stay in office as long as Ziem did. Um, that the South Vietnamese might not have loved Ziem, but at least they respected him. Uh, they admired his accomplishments. Uh, unlike his successors, he didn't visibly profit from being head of South Vietnam. Uh, when, when Nguyen Van Thieu flew out of Saigon in 1975, he flew out with a couple million dollars in gold bars in his plane. And American observers couldn't help but note that Ziem, by comparison, slept on the same monastic cot every night, ate a very Spartan diet, um, basically seemed to incarnate more the kind of selfless nationalistic leader that maybe the United States really wanted to support. So that therefore we should have stayed with him. Uh, yes, it wasn't an ideal arrangement, but things became so much worse after he was killed that uh, we ought to have kept him in office. And that was also an argument made by a number of historical participants, like Senator Mike Mansfield, like Vice President and then President Lyndon Johnson, who argued that uh, uh, overthrowing Ziem was the worst mistake we ever made. I don't agree with that argument. I'm, I understand it. However, I feel obliged to point out that uh, when Ziem took office, there were only a handful of uh, American advisors in South Vietnam. At the time he was killed, there were 16,000 American advisors in South Vietnam. France, the predominant Western military power in Vietnam for almost a century, 
withdrew from the country uh, within a year of Ziem's assumption of office, pulled all of its troops out, and basically conferred full responsibility for stemming the communist tide in Southeast Asia upon the United States. America's role in Vietnam changed from advice and support, I would argue, to active co-belligerency while Ziem was in office, and opposition to Ziem was increasing at the time of his death. It was not decreasing. There was no way we could have kept him in office, even had we chosen to do so, without committing more and more troops. Uh, I think the fact that Ziem was the most successful, if that term means anything in this case, the most successful South Vietnamese president, only indicates just how futile uh, an endeavor trying to preserve this artificial state of South Vietnam was to begin with. That, uh, um, yes, he was the, the longest serving and perhaps the most stable of all of the uh, South Vietnamese leaders, but he still didn't have any popular support. He couldn't have any popular support because the only reason he was in office was because he was sponsored by the United States. Hence, he could never have competed with Ho Chi Minh for the indigenous love and affection of his people, uh, and neither could any of his successors. I think, actually, the question of whether we should have overthrown him is the wrong question. The proper question is, should we ever, ever support him to begin with? Should we ever have become involved in South Vietnam to begin with? And the answer to those questions, I submit, is pretty obvious, no. There has been a, a rather um, intense debate among historians about how we should conceptualize Ngo Dinh Diem, where his nine-year reign fits in our understanding of the Vietnam War. Uh, a number of historians, mostly younger historians, mostly historians who have uh, um, uh, Vietnamese language skills, who've gone to study uh, in archives in uh, Hanoi or in Ho Chi Minh City, the former Saigon, uh, have argued that we, we need to reconceptualize the Ziem years so as to give him more agency. That he's too often been portrayed as an American puppet, as an American pawn, as someone that we just picked up and installed in power and who never had any ideas of his own who never um, uh, came up with any, any strategies for fighting the Viet Cong on his own, who basically carried out America's orders. Uh, I'm very sympathetic with that argument because the fact is that Ziem was, uh, uh, did have a great deal of agency. He was very much his own man. He did, to a large extent, write his own fate. He did not like taking orders from the Americans. And he did institute some programs, like the infamous Strategic Hamlet program, that were not devised in Washington, that he came up with himself. But I think that this new round of scholarship airs in going so far that it doesn't acknowledge that the United States was ultimately responsible for them being the leader of South Vietnam. That if he hadn't been our candidate, he never would have become president of South Vietnam. That however independent-minded he may have been, however nationalistic he may have been, however much he might have bridled at American pressure or American dictation, the fact is that uh, uh, there was no way that he was going to be elevated among more popular, uh, more politically savvy, South Vietnamese leaders unless the United States was behind him, that that was the crucial element in his gaining power and retaining it for so long. To say that does not disempower him. It doesn't turn him into a figurehead. It just acknowledges power realities in the 1950s and early 1960s. Ask just about any historian, and he or she will tell you that archive, archivists are his or her favorite uh, people. Um, I've been extraordinarily lucky in terms of uh, the archives that I've had to visit for my work, uh, the professionalism, the endless patience uh, that uh, the archivists have demonstrated. I've been to a bunch of different archives, uh, the Eisenhower Library in Abilene, Kansas, the John Foster Dulles Papers in Princeton, the uh, Mike Mansfield Papers in Missoula, Montana, the Thomas Dooley Papers in St. Louis, the American Friends of Vietnam Papers at uh, Texas Tech University in Lubbock, uh, Texas, uh, the National Archives, obviously, in Maryland. Um, there are a couple others that escape me at the moment. but. Uh, um, in, without exception, the archivists at these institutions have been tremendously helpful. Uh, you have to do this kind of legwork. You simply have to. There, there, the, the State Department does release this series called Foreign Relations of the United States, which has declassified uh, documents that have been vetted and uh, um, either edited for reasons of consistency or because certain things are still classified. And uh, lazier historians will just rely on FRUS, they call it F-R-U-S, Foreign Relations of the United States. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to write a real serious work of scholarship, you've just got to go to these archives yourself. And there's all kinds of marvelous material that FRUS leaves out because its uh, editors don't think that this material is of, uh, either they think it's too sensitive or they don't think it's very important. And I found the best stuff I've found has usually been um, material that's been ignored by other people who've poured over it. So. Um, uh, there's simply no way to be a serious historian without going to the archives. And uh, with the exception of Lubbock, Texas, which I had the misfortune to visit in the hottest summer that that area has experienced in over a century, 
just about every visit I've had to an archive has been extraordinarily pleasant. Uh, archivists are my favorite people. Plus, the uh, staff at the Maureen and Mike Mansfield Library in Missoula, Montana, has yet to bill me for the uh, almost $500 worth of Xeroxes that I made wh uh, while I was there researching my dissertation about, about seven years ago. So uh, Senator Mansfield could not have asked for a more accommodating group of archivists to oversee his papers. I'm very grateful to them. Maybe one day they will send me a bill, maybe if they see this. Teaching the Vietnam War to um, this generation of students is a very daunting prospect. And I'm, I made a decision a couple of years ago when I started structuring my class on the Vietnam War that I, I stuck with because I think it was a good decision. Uh, I think a lot of instructors have difficulty recognizing that the Cold War is over, that it has been over for a long time, that for students of this generation, the Cold War is history. It's ancient history. And therefore, there are these terms that people of my generation toss around that have no meaning for uh, freshmen and sophomores nowadays. Containment, McCarthyism, it doesn't mean anything. See, these are relics of a bygone era. So that if you start the Vietnam War class where most Vietnam War classes begin, say, with the uh, Kennedy or Johnson administrations, students are immediately adrift. They have no idea what you're talking about. The only way to really teach a course in the Vietnam War to make it comprehensible to students of this generation is to start with the end of World War II and the beginning of the Cold War, and uh, set up how the uh, international disposition of power, uh, how, how, uh, how this was uh, uh, arrayed in 1945, 1946, how American-Soviet contests over Europe rapidly spread to the so-called Third World of uh, Asia, Africa, the Middle East, and uh, Latin America, uh, why it is that American policymakers began seeing every country as a potential domino that was either with us or against us, so that even if it's a former French colony on the southeastern corner of the Eurasian landmass that has no conceivable strategic or economic importance to the United States, if you're viewing the world through these kind of Cold War goggles where every gain for the other side is a loss for us, then there's a certain internal logic to why we got involved in Vietnam. I think you have to start way back then. Otherwise, by the time you get to 1965, students are, are totally at a loss. So uh, that's been the the one major difference between my class and the, on the Vietnam War and other ones that I've taken is I don't begin in 63, 64, 65. I start with 1945. And I always tell students during the first couple lectures, look, you have to stay with me here. I know that um, when I'm talking about, say, the war in Korea, or when I'm talking about uh, uh, the House on American Activities Committee uh, activities uh, during the, uh, the 1940s and early 1950s, you'll be asking yourselves, what the heck does this have to do with the Vietnam War? Please trust me. Uh, I guarantee you that by the time the course is over, you'll realize that by giving this kind of background and this kind of context, I've helped to render comprehensible what otherwise might just be a mass of facts and data that you wouldn't be able to anchor in any kind of particular historical moment.